Oops. Now. Thank you. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Jose Aguto, uh, and we are blessed to have you uh, for this webinar today um, with regard to the synodal process. Um, my name is Jose Aguto. I'm the executive director of the Catholic Climate Covenant, and we will be addressing an extremely timely issue for the U.S. Catholic Church and the global church with regard to the question, how do we respond to the Vatican's call to embark on the seven-year Laudato Si' action platform journey? Alongside with the Synod on Synodality, as well as the USCCB's call for the Eucharistic Revival Movement, um, we are so honored to have presenters on this webinar who have heard this question both globally and in their diocese and nationally and have some much needed wisdom to impart to us in the US Catholic community. Before we get started, a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, this webinar is, uh, to is to promote diocesan activity for the Synod is made possible by the Silos Foundation in thanksgiving to Blessed Francis Xavier Silos of the Redemptorists, who engaged in parish ministry in the mid 1800s across the United States and is being considered for canonization. Um, also to note that the webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording will be sent to you within the next 48 hours. We also wanna note uh, that this webinar is scheduled to go until uh, 1.15. Um, and please use the chat feature to communicate with others on the webinar. But if you want to ask questions of the panelists, please use the Q&A box. And we will try to get to as many questions as possible. Um, hold on a moment while I work on my screen here. Um, and so we also wanted to start with a prayer um, that is used, has been used in the synodal process across the world. Um, and so we ask that for uh, you, for all of us to take a moment in silence, recognizing that we are always in the presence of God. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We stand before you, Holy Spirit, as we gather together in your name. With you alone to guide us, make yourself at home in our hearts. Teach us the way we must go and how we are to pursue it. We are weak and sinful. Do not let us promote disorder. Do not let ignorance lead us down the wrong path, nor partiality influence our actions. Let us find in you our unity so that we may journey together to eternal life and not stray from the way of truth and what is right. All this we ask of you who are at work in every place and time in communion of the Father and the Son forever and ever, amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Uh, Jose, yes. uh, this is past, uh, your slides are not moving um, and you oh, may yeah. want to show a uh, slideshow for uh, view. Oh, very good, I apologize. Um, I have that in the screen, there we go, so sorry. Um, okay, Is, does that work, Paz? Yes, but you may want to go to the top and click slideshow, and that way it gets bigger. Thank you. Slideshow. It's, it's right after animations and review. Top. Okay, very good. I, I may have the wrong um, slide up. Um, I apologize. I just... um, I, we'll just to dispense with that. I apologize. I'll friend. share screen. Thank you. Um, very good. Um, so I am delighted to do a brief introduction um, with uh, of our presenters, and then um, we'll do more fulsome um, introductions of when they begin. Um, and so um, we are honored to have as presenters today, Sister Natalie Beckwart, uh, Undersecretary to the General Secretariat for the Synod of Bishops. Father David McCallum, Executive Director of the Discerning Leadership Program. K 
Carrie Robinson, Executive Partner of the Leadership Roundtable, and three representatives from the Diocese of Davenport, Kent Ferris, who is the Director of Social Action, Patrick Schmedeke, Director of Evangelization, and Deacon Francis Agnoli, the Director of Liturgy and the Director of Deacon Formation. Um, and so we are gonna start first with uh, Sister Natalie and Father David together. Uh, and they will, um, Sister Natalie will share from her computer, her slides. And Sister Natalie um, is a member of the congregation of Xavier's. She was appointed a consultor to the Synod of Bishops in 2019 since last year and is serving as one of two undersecretaries to the General Secretariat of the Synod of Bishops. From 2008 to 2018, she oversaw the national service for the evangelization of young people and for vocations within the Bishops' Conference of France. Reverend Dr. David McCallum serves as the founding di executive director of the Program of Discerning Leadership, a special project for the General Curia of the Society of Jesus, Georgetown, and the Gregorian University. The program provides leadership formation for senior Vatican officials and major superiors of religious orders in Rome, as well as internationally. Currently, Father McCallum serves as a member of the Secretariat for the Synod of Bishops Commission on Methodology, supporting the synodal process initiative by Pope Francis as, as, and as adjunct faculty in the Institute of Anthropology, Interdisciplinary Studies of Human Dignity and Care at the Pontifical Gregorian University. So thank you very much, Sister Natalie and Father McCallum. Um, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Jose. Thank you, all the team of uh, Catholic Climate Covenant. It's truly uh, a pleasure to be with you today and uh, to have this opportunity to share with uh, all the participants on your network about uh, this uh, synod on, uh, on synodality. So we are delighted to do it in a synodal way with uh, both voices, uh, Father David and me, uh, to explore together uh, this topic of uh, synodality and uh, especially in connection to uh, Laudato Si. <laughs> so as you can see, the, the, the logo of the synod is truly uh, expressing something of what we are trying to live through this synodal process to be um, uh, missionary pilgrims all together as people of God, uh, whereas our age, our gender, our status, vocation, and all guided uh, by the Holy Spirit to really live this synodal journey as a spiritual uh, journey. And truly, we are doing also the synodal process because synodality is the way of being the church today, according to the will of God, in a dynamic of discerning and listening together to the voice of the Holy Spirit. So it, we can say synodality is the call of God for the church of the third millennium. It's a vocation. Uh, of the church and if it's truly a call when we are trying to answer this call all together we can really be confident that God will give the grace to answer the call and I give the floor to Father David. Thanks Natalie uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all and um, I think there's something special about this um, this invitation for us to address the relationships between synodality, laudato si, and this call to a deeper participation in the Eucharistic uh, celebration. And, and that is that these, these three initiatives are not separate, but they're deeply integral to one another. They fertilize and enhance and nourish each other. Um, so our, our desire today in this brief presentation is really to establish the connections between them. And to deepen this connection uh, between uh, synodality and uh, Laudato Si and the Eucharist, we have these three key words for the synod because the title of the synod is for a synodal church, communion, participation, and mission. So it's the, the keys, in fact, 
to really live this churning together. Uh, we can say that the vision of a synodal church is truly rooted in the mystery of the Trinity and in the Eucharist. And each synod open with a Eucharist and the closure of the synod is also a Eucharist. The Eucharist is the synax, the, the Eucharistic synax is the model, the paradigm of uh, the, the church as people of God. And what we have called to live is to be uh, in this journey as a Eucharistic journey also, we, we can say. And to explore more and to have a better idea of what is the synod and what is synodality, we want to do that now with a video uh, that is uh, rather well done. It has been uh, prepared by a diocese from India, but you will see it's uh, in a few minutes, you will have all the important uh, elements uh, to understand this synod. So I share this video now. You matter. This is exactly the cry and belief of the Universal Church in this Synod on Synodality. Did you know that in October 2021, the entire Church entered into a Synod? Pope Francis opened the Synod in Rome and every diocese across the whole world was called to celebrate the opening of the Synod at the local level. The theme for this Synod is for a synodal church, communion, participation, and mission. Don't worry if you've missed the beginning. We are here to help you catch up because this synod is going to be unlike any other. From 2021 to 2023, it will be a journey of sharing, reflecting, and listening at all levels across the entire church. But hold on, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let us first understand what is a synod? A synod is a gathering, traditionally of bishops. The word synod comes from the Greek synhodos, meaning the same way or the same path. Synods were very common in the first centuries, giving bishops the opportunity to meet and discuss issues of importance for the life of the church. The institution of the synod of bishops was established by Paul VI on September 15, 1965. In keeping with the request of the Fathers of the Second Vatican Council to maintain the collegial spirit fostered by the Council. Since then, synods have been organized every two or three years, bringing together bishops, experts and various delegates to discuss different topics. In each case, bishops vote on a final document. Then, the Pope writes his own text called an apostolic exhortation to open new pathways and shed new light on what was discussed at the Synod so that it can radiate across the entire church. So what is synodality? Synodality is about journeying together. This happens through listening to one another in order to hear what God is saying to all of us. It is realizing that the Holy Spirit can speak through anyone to help us walk forward together on our journey as the people of God. The point is not that we take two years to understand some new buzzword that will soon fade. Synodality is no passing phase. It is a call to be a new way of being church. In other words, it is walking together the very heart of what the church is all about. St. John Chrysostom said that for him, church and synod were synonyms, since the church is all about walking together. In this sense, is a way of renewing the church from her deepest roots in order to be more united with one another and better carry out our mission in the world. In simpler terms, a synodal church is a church that listens. As Pope Francis stated in the commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the institution of the Synod of Bishops, it is a mutual listening in which everyone has something to learn. The lay faithful, the bishops, the Pope, 
all listening to one another and all listening to the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, in order to know what He is saying to the church. What's special about this synod on synodality? This synod is totally unprecedented for at least three reasons. It is no longer only a one-month synod of bishops but a two-year synodal process for the entire people of God. All the baptized. All are invited and no one is to be left behind or excluded. It is a synod that aims on giving the entire church a lived experience of synodality. It's not just about filling in a questionnaire, but gathering the fruits of what the Holy Spirit is saying to us here and now. The aim of the Synod is not just to talk about synodality, but to put synodality into practice, starting now, in every diocese, parish and country across the whole world. This calls all of us, at every level of the Church, to renew our way of being and working together, moving forward. So what can you do? Find out what's going on in your diocese and your parish to experience the synod at a local level. Each diocese is called to facilitate local synodal meetings to involve all the faithful in this journey undertaken by the entire church. Since the entire purpose of the synod is to listen to everyone, even children, trusting that the Holy Spirit can speak through anyone, Let's start by truly listening to each other, especially those who are in the margins of our churches, who are forgotten, ignored or not listened to. If you are an elder or a person in position, listen to those in your care. If you are a parent, hear what your children are trying to communicate to you. If you are a priest, pay attention to what your parishioners are voicing. If you are a superior in your community, listen to what the young ones are struggling with. Remember, if you want to be heard, you must also be willing to listen. And finally, pray for the whole church. Ask the Holy Spirit to inspire and lead us in this beautiful journey. So, uh, just after this video, I invite you just to have a takeaway from this video, something you want to, to keep. And now we will continue and I will give the floor to Father David to explore more how synodality and integral ecology that are two key themes of Pope Francis pontificate are in fact very much connected. There is a, a kind of articulation, we can say, uh, between the concepts, practices of integral ecology and synodality. They have the same principle and methodology. So, Father David. Thanks, Sister Natalie. So, I think that when we, when we think about the relationship between the social sphere and the ways in which we organize ourselves and uh, use our resources and, uh, in a sense, orient ourselves toward missions and, and accomplish them together, we can sometimes see that as a separate project than our relationship to the resources themselves, the earth, creation. Um, we can sometimes see ourselves as separate from nature, as if somehow as human beings we are apart. And uh, the beautiful thing about integral ecology and this vision of Laudato Si is that Pope Francis has a sense, a perception really, of the totally interconnected relationship between ourselves, the natural world around us, the earth from which we've taken life and give life back, and, and also the way in which we're exercising agency and collecting ourselves, using power, uh, using our authority, and trying to accomplish things as a church. The, the relationship between these is mutually co-enhancing. It's not separate, it's not antagonistic. And the fact that there is this coherence between integral ecology and the invitation to come together in this collaborative way as church, as people of God, 
is a sign itself of the Holy Spirit working to develop coherence, working to help promote uh, the, the common of common project that we have ahead of us at a critical time in our history, when we know that our capacity to come together and to accomplish something hard, something seemingly impossible together is absolutely essential. Um, synodality, that way of organizing ourselves and uh, thinking differently about the relationship between hierarchy and participation, learns so much from the natural world and the way in which we know that all living things are so tightly interconnected and interdependent with one another. And likewise, the way in which we, we work on this question of um, conversion, right, of social structures, of our economies, of the ways in which we relate to our resources and then give back to the planet, this too is enhanced by what we learn from synodality. So uh, we can say that we are living synodality uh, at this time uh, where we are today. And the methodology of synodality, you first begin to read what we say the sign of the time. And the idea is that this path of synodality, which God is the call of God, it is what God expects of the church of the third millennium, is coming from this reading of the sign of the times that emphasized and highlighted that we are in a fragmented world in need of connectivity and solidarity. And Laudato Si, as Father David told us, really give us the sense that everything is interconnected, everything is interrelated. And if you look at the first uh, part of the preparatory document for the Synod, and I really encourage you to read this preparatory document, uh, you can see through this discerning uh, of the sign of the time in the light of the gospel that um, the cry of the poor and the cry of the earth are one of the signs. And we are in this time calling for this awareness to be one family living in our common home, all in the same boat. And uh, that's also a call for synodality to be one church, to serve one family, to help to build uh, one family. And it was uh, especially through the synod on the Amazon, uh, highlighting new paths for the church and for integral ecology that we could articulate better this vision, we can say, of uh, intertwining uh, integral ecology and uh, synodality. And so uh, that's, uh, in, we can truly say that the ecological conversion and the synodal conversion go end in end. And the way to implement Laudato Si, the way to help uh, all our societies to really uh, embrace this ecological conversion for the church, it is the path of synodality. So I will let uh, Father David, if you want to add something about this uh, conversion uh, that has to recognize that the interaction of all that is created. Yeah, you know, I think that if we're honest about it, each of us has our own path of conversion, our path of metanoia in order to live more sustainably, to live with a lighter footprint and, um, and also to, to interact with our brothers and sisters in a different way. Um, as St. Francis before us, our ancestor in faith knew, there was a way in which when we begin to perceive properly our sisters and brothers, not only our siblings in the human race, but also our, our fellow species sharing this planet, and we realize this profound interrelatedness, we cannot treat them as objects anymore. We have to actually treat all life as a subject with its own uh, dignity and with its own requirement for reverence. This, um, this changes our relationship to what we consume, to the food we eat, to the way in which we, uh, we relate to um, that uh, natural world around us. And this path to conversion is one that we have to support each other on. It's not one that we can necessarily do by ourselves, which again brings us back to this question of how in synodality we walk with one another. 
we do so as um, as fellow companions on a journey, and um, as we would uh, if we were on a pilgrimage together, we'd look out for each other. This process of change, this process of letting go of the habits that um, have been overly consumeristic, those uh, those mindsets that are tied to competition rather than collaboration or cooperation, these are what we're called to change. So you can see that what is the aim of uh, the Synod 21-23? We, you know, the Synod was opened in Rome in October 9 and 10 with Pope Francis and then in all your dioceses the week after. So now it is the old church for the first time in the history, the old church is convoked in the Synod. We are living a very important uh, event. So some theologians say that the most important ecclesial event after Vatican II. And the aim of this Synod is to relearn synodality. That was in fact the style of the early church. Uh, but synodality is a learning by doing. It, we, we learn it by experience. So the aim of this synod is truly the synodal conversion of the church, how to help each other to really journey together and to put into practice the synodal nature of the church. That means uh, we are called to have a kind of synodalization of the whole church at all levels. And among the objectives of the synod, it is first to recall how the spirit has guided the church's journey through history and today. So how we are already doing this journey together, but then to continue uh, uh, to exercise uh, in synodality by living a participative and inclusive ecclesial process that offers everyone, especially those who for various reasons find themselves on the margins, the opportunity to express themselves and to be heard in order to contribute to the edification of the people of God. So that's why it's truly a challenge and a big issue to involve uh, the great diversity of the people of God through the synod, especially at the level of each diocese, and with a focus on people who are on the margin. And that's why all your networks, your platform, you know, are truly uh, called to be part of uh, the synod and to find way to do the synodal uh, consultation. So Father David, if you want to comment a little bit on that. <clears throat> yeah, as Sister Natalie was saying, um, diversity, as we know from our understanding of, of biological um, uh, sciences, is absolutely essential to the health of any system. And we live at a time, if we're honest about it, as those of us who are Americans, who um, we find ourselves at a time of great fragmentation and polarization where the ability to open ourselves to diverse points of view has become compromised by uh, many of the dynamics in our culture today. Synodality, in fact, is the Holy Spirit's invitation to us to rediscover the power of our diversity when we find within ourselves an openness to listen to others, to understand their points of view and widen our perspective we see reality more accurately as it is. This is uh, a call to, again, a kind of conversion of mind and heart and will. Um, and it comes at a very important time in our nation's history when we've perhaps in our own lifetimes never been more separate than we are now. Um, the other element that Sister Natalie points to is the way in which networks operate. We, again, we understand from biological systems that networks are in fact a very powerful way of affecting um, and supporting life, but also of creating change. Uh, and so this invitation to collaborate across your various organizations and to do so for a common purpose, leveraging our individual gifts and capabilities for this common cause is really what the invitation for the Laudato Si network is about. Sister Natalie? Yes, so now it's time to, to conclude, but we really hope that you could, uh, everywhere where you are, you could create this synodal experience and uh, gather the, the fruit uh, with this focus on this basic question of the synodal process, 
That is how is this journey together really happening today in your local church, in your network, in your community, and what steps does the spirit invite us to take in order to grow in our journey together? So it's truly an exercise of discernment. And for that, you have 10 teams to explore uh, that are, you have all these materials in the preparatory document and also many dioceses uh, adapt it. Uh, but I just want to highlight that in this team five, sharing responsibility for our common mission, uh, you have uh, explicitly this question, how does the community support its members committed to service in society, especially in caring for the common home? Uh, and then you have also a team about dialogue in church and society. What are the places and modes of dialogue within your, your particular church? So that's a way also to, uh, to bring the experience uh, of your organizations and to be part of this journey. And our conclusion will be just to highlight that uh, at the end, the purpose of the Synod and therefore of this consultation is not to produce documents, but to plan dreams, draw forth prophecies and visions, allow hope to be nourished, inspire trust, bind up wounds, weave together relationships, awaken a dawn of hope, learn from one another, and create a bright resourcefulness that will enlighten minds, warm up, give strength to our ends. So that's what we wish for you. And so we can continue this path of synodality, this path also of uh, ecological conversion that in a way we can, um, to put it in a nutshell, is to pass from the I to the we, and to pass from a pattern of competition to a pattern of cooperation. So I will uh, give the last word to Father David and uh, already I thank you for this opportunity to share with you. I'm not going to take the last word, Natalie. I think you summarized it beautifully. Thanks so much. Well, thank you so much, uh, Sister Natalie and Father David for the, the blessing of your time and, and, and continuing to evangelize on the Synod across the globe. I know you've done many of these presentations and so we're blessed to have you with us today. Um, and likewise, so blessed to introduce Carrie Robertson, Robinson, pardon me, Carrie, um, who is the founding executive director and partner, partner for global and national initiatives at Leadership Roundtable, which is an, an organization of laity, religious and clergy working together to promote best practices and accountability in the management, finances, communication, and human resource development of the Catholic Church in the United States. Um, the Leadership Roundtable has partnered with the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, the Vatican, and church leaders in the synodal process, so we are especially blessed to have Carrie here to speak with us. She is also an ardent advocate of Catholic social teaching, women, and young adults in the church, and so uh, send it to you, Carrie. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much, Jose. I, uh, I have a sleeping brand new rescue puppy that I am hoping is going to behave during uh, these brief remarks, but I suspect there is no more forgiving audience than those who are assembled here. Um, first, it is a great pleasure to be able to call Sister Natalie and Father David friends and colleagues. If there's anything you derive from today, I hope it comes with a growing confidence in the opportunity before us, in part because of the extraordinary care and thoughtfulness and leadership Sister Natalie, Father David, and their colleagues show in overseeing this global synod. I was very struck by a few of, of their comments, um, being the call to being missionary pilgrims of, of the people of God, the role of the Holy Spirit, how the three initiatives, synodality, Laudato Si, and the Eucharist are deeply integrated, the emphasis on inclusivity, communion, participation, deep listening, the call to conversion, reverence for life, for creation, cooperation, not competition, the invitation to discover, to rediscover the power of our, of our diversity. And then those concluding 10 themes, Sister Natalie lifted up for us. Absolutely beautiful. Thank you both. 
I've been asked to speak briefly and specifically on how we make it possible to lift up the voices of the laity and the marginalized and hear the cry of the earth and the poor as central pieces of the synodal process. My background is in Catholic philanthropy. Our great grandparents created a Catholic foundation that is issued in more than 75 years of service to the global church spanning five generations. From a very, very young age, it has been instilled in us to understand the blessing of baptism as conferring both rights and responsibilities. And I've taken lay agency, lay leadership and active lay participation in the life of the church seriously all of my life. This culminated in helping Jeff Boise bring Leadership Roundtable to life to serve and strengthen the church by promoting co-responsibility, effective and ethical leadership and contemporary best managerial practices all to benefit the church and the church's mission. So I'm particularly happy to participate in this conversation and be invited to speak about the role of the laity, but also more broadly to participate in the global synod itself and to assist church leaders in carrying out the synod. I'm going to presume that our audience today is particularly knowledgeable and passionate about the injunction to all of us to care for our common human family and our common home. That, it, that is constitutive of what it means to be Christian. I believe that there is no time like the present to initiate radically important, hope-filled matters of great potential and positive consequence. We, all of us, have such an opportunity before us. I know it is tempting to be pessimistic or worse cynical, but that is not what we're called to be. We are a people of hope. Imagine if we didn't have this opportunity uh, to engage in deep listening, incorporate moments of silence to invoke the presence and stirring of the Holy Spirit, this opportunity to speak in candor and charity, to reveal what breaks our hearts and what ennobles us. Pope Francis has emphasized and prized co-responsibility, ordained religious and lay people working in partnership for the sake of the mission of the church. And this diversity matters. In our family and also at Leadership Roundtable, we have an expression, everyone has a piece of the wisdom. We are all myopic in our, on our own or in our own narrowly defined groups. We absolutely need the diversity of perspectives and experiences to be better informed, to be healthy, to be whole. And now emerging from a pandemic where no part of the church or globe was spared of that experience, it seems particularly fortuitous to engage in dialogue in deep listening, in prayer, in imagination, attentiveness to the Holy Spirit and to one another, to literally dream a better way forward, particularly in light of the looming environmental challenges, crises, pleas that also bind us as a human family. In this way, all three invitations, as Father David said, all three invitations, especially to those of us living in the United States, the Synod, the Laudato Si platform, and the Eucharistic revival are interwoven and frankly need all of us. So personally, I feel like I have been waiting for this my whole life and I am ready. A couple of additional thoughts. The Synod provides us an opportunity to truly speak from the heart. Therefore, it stands to reason that what we care most deeply about, what is uppermost in our minds and deepest in our hearts, has the chance to be voiced and shared and heard. I do, however, want to caution against arriving at this invitation with an agenda. My closest priest friend used to say, you know that the opening prayer at the start of a meeting has been effective 
when the agenda of the meeting changes. In other words, it is as important to speak our wisdom as it is to deeply listen and enter into the wisdom of others. Second, diversity factors greatly in the synodal process. Sister Natalie and Father David emphasize that. We simply need all voices, all backgrounds, all experiences, all wisdom. And the synod will be as effective as our own responsibility for it. We are being asked to participate and to be channels of inclusion for others who fall outside of the normal parish or diocesan community. It is why I commend Catholic Climate Covenant for hosting this discussion and for playing a leadership role in reaching diverse constituents. This is incumbent upon all of us. It is lay agency, baptismal responsibility. Begin by speaking to your pastor or bishop. Ask directly about the plans for the synod locally and offer to help. If there is resistance, be part of the invitation to all of us to cast a wide net, have a preferential option for young adults and for those on the margins, disaffected Catholics, wounded Catholics. There is a critical role for the voices of women in the synod. I've been struck from the beginning at how much of an emphasis Sister Natalie herself puts on including young adults, not just as participants, but as members of leadership teams facilitating the Synod. Third, I hope you find this as encouraging as my colleagues and I do. From the moment the Synod was announced, leaders in the church, particularly those leading national Catholic networks, like Catholic Climate Covenant and national Catholic charities, including the church's public ministries in health, education, social services, justice, peace, and care for creation, reached out to us at Leadership Roundtable wanting to be part of the Synod. At Leadership Roundtable, we have hosted convenings to train facilitators and next week are conducting our next one for leaders of National Catholic Ministries and Apostolates. I'm thrilled that the leadership of Catholic Climate Covenant, as well as other leaders who belong to the Laudato Si platform, are participating in this. Um, and Jose, we look forward to being with you at that. All of this advocacy of Sister Natalie and Father David's work on the Global Synod and of the Synod here in the US and Canada has allowed us to create and post resources on our Leadership Roundtable website. I particularly commend the facilitation guide that you can find there in Spanish and English. Finally, the larger point is, is not really to simply conduct a Synod but to learn how to live synodally. Learning how to live synodally will have a huge impact on our ability to address the crisis of climate change together. It will make the Eucharistic revival that much more effective. And frankly, it will help heal the divisions within our church and our country. An invitation to dream, an emphasis on the positive, not a litany of complaints, but rather a new way of being, of relating to one another and being church. By gathering as a people of faith, we hope to weave new and deeper relationships, to learn from one another, to build bridges, to enlighten minds, to warm hearts, and to restore strength for our common mission. It reminds me of one of my favorite life maxims, celebrate what is right in order to find the courage and strength to fix what is wrong. So to close, Jose, Paz, Dan, all of your colleagues at Catholic Climate Covenant, thank you for this invitation and opportunity for conversation. And thank you for your dedication to calling us and helping us be exemplary stewards of our beautiful world and our common home. Well, thank you, Carrie, for your beautiful words and uh, the strength of, of your message. Um, I want to note uh, for all of us today that uh, we are going to um, one 15 or 15 minutes after the hour, this way that we are able to give uh, a time for um, our last set of speakers and really excited to hear from these representatives from the Diocese of Davenport doing amazing, amazing work 
to apply all of these uh, initiatives. And so I'm pleased to introduce Kent Ferris, who is the Director of Social Action and Catholic Charities at the Diocese. He is a professed secular Franciscan. He's a, a deacon candidate and is completing his master's degree in pastoral studies at St. Ambrose University. Patrick Schmedeke is the Director of Evangelization. Um, he received his Master's of Divinity at the University of Notre Dame and contributes regularly to Grotto Network and the Catholic Messenger. And finally, Deacon Francis Agnoli serves as the Director of Liturgy and the Director of Deacon Formation, um, also earning a Master's of Divinity and a Master's of Arts of Theology from St. John's University and a Doctor of Ministry from the Aquinas Institute. And prior to entering church ministry, Deacon Agnoli was a family physician in rural Appalachia. So gentlemen, please, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen and then hand the floor over to Frank. Good morning from Davenport, Iowa. Uh, as introduced, I'm Deacon Frank Ignoli on, on behalf of my colleagues, Kent and Patrick. Thank you for your warm welcome and for the opportunity to share our story with you. In case you don't know, our diocese is located in the southeast corner of Iowa. We're a mostly rural diocese with just over um, 85,000 Catholics spread over 22 counties and calling 74 parishes home. We have a fairly small chancery staff, 12 full-time whose work is more directly related to pastoral ministry, and double that number in finance support and maintenance positions. We're joined by another 10 part-time employees and seven indispensable volunteers. As news of the Synod and its timeline broke, we became acutely aware, after the initial panic subsided, that we needed to coordinate our efforts if we were going to make this work. We were already looking ahead to the Laudato Si action platform, and we knew that the Eucharistic revival was in the works. So as a first step, we began to set up a timeline, as you see here. What needed to be done by when? What would we need to prioritize? It's a living document. We keep adding more to it as these journeys unfold. And we needed to figure out who was going to be involved. When we brought the combined timeline to Bishop Zinkula's attention, he saw this as a golden opportunity to be intentional about taking a truly integrated approach to ministry in the diocese, with the ultimate end being evangelization, inviting people into a living relationship with Christ. This really isn't a new approach for us. We do usually play nice together, but we knew we needed to be especially attentive to communication and cooperation, given the complexity of the initiatives and the schedule involved, and given the limited staff time and other resources available. So while these initiatives will involve the whole chancery, we needed to put an intentional structure in place to coordinate our efforts. We modified our usual monthly schedule of meetings to now set aside two Wednesdays per month to meet as what we call synodalers. The bishop, those of us who serve as contact persons for the diocese in these three initiatives, and those other offices that will be most directly impacted by these three undertakings and whose support and resources will be instrumental in making them as successful as possible. That seems a lot, like a lot of extra work. So why bother? Why not let each office do their own thing? Why not set one or more of these initiatives aside? As I mentioned, there are practical reasons for working together. But more importantly, the primary reason is theological. If synodal describes the church, how do we make sure to approach the other initiatives in a synodal fashion? How do we journey together towards the vision of church that is being set before? 
a way of being church that extends beyond the initial more formal stages of these three initiatives. Thank you, Frank. I will briefly share how we are implementing the Synod in our diocese. Since the opening liturgy for the Synod in October, we built a web page, created resources, and offered training for those who would be leading the Synod in parishes. Listening sessions are happening now through April, and we will synthesize listening session findings to send our diocesan report to the USCCB by June 30th. As part of planning, we needed to discern what question to ask at listening sessions. The Synod Vatimecum, or Handbook from Rome, proposes this question. A synodal church in announcing the gospel journeys together. How is this journeying together happening today in your local church? What steps does the spirit invite us to take in order to grow in our journeying together. We believe this question is important, but we also wanted to ask the same question at all listening sessions, whether in a parish or in a homeless shelter. We realized that we needed to translate this question into everyday language. Around the same time, in late November, there was a webinar that two of our panelists today were on, Sister Natalie and Carrie. In this webinar, a listener asked what he should be asking people so that the synod process moves forward. Carrie's suggestion was to ask this question, what breaks your heart? So it is fun to share today that we built on Carrie's suggestion, thank you Carrie, as well as the spirit of the synod in the synod handbook from Rome. Thank you, Sister Natalie, and landed on this question. Based on your personal experience, what breaks your heart and what fills your heart about the Catholic Church? This question invites people to express their sadness, their joy, and to discern how the Holy Spirit is calling us as we listen humbly to people's experience. We want to reach as many people as possible. There are two distinct prongs to our approach. The first is listening sessions. The second is our diocese's 58,000 cups of coffee initiative. For listening sessions, we asked parishes to build a parish synod team. It became clear that there was much work to be done, that many hands make lighter work and many voices make for better discernment. We have asked parish synod teams to engage three questions as part of their discernment. First, who are they listening to? Second, where is the listening taking place? And third, who is doing the listening? These questions help us cast our nets widely so we don't only focus on the voices we typically hear from. Our second prong is the 58,000 Cups of Coffee initiative. This is an effort unique to our diocese. The backstory of this, of this initiative has three components. First, Last fall, we learned that there were just over 19,000 people in our pews on an average weekend. This is around 60% of pre-pandemic mass attendance. This is a dramatic drop-off. Second, our bishop has a deep desire that we focus on evangelization. That is, getting outside the four walls of the parish and bringing the joy of faith into everyday, everyday life. And third, and because Sister Natalie is here today, it is a particular delight to share that I heard her say in an interview, quote, synodality begins with coffee, end quote. So what if we invited all Catholics in the diocese to personally be involved in the synod over a cup of coffee? That's exactly what we are doing. Multiply 19,399 by three, and you get just over 58,000, hence 58,000 cups of coffee. We are inviting everyone in our pews to ask our synod question to three people. One person who is also already in our pews, one person who was before the pandemic, and one person who has either never been in our pews or who stopped practicing long ago. 
So how is the Synod going so far? Since the first listening session in our diocese on January 4th, just over a month ago, we have received 36 listening session reports which share the experience of over 300 participants. We anticipate a significant uptick in the coming weeks as parishes continue to implement the Synod. While we have been laying the groundwork for listening sessions since October, the 58,000 cups of coffee initiative is newer. Just last week, we ordered 10,000 coasters, the mock ups of which you can see on the right of your screen to distribute to parishes to help promote these one on one conversations. We are using print and digital media to get the word out about the Synod. We anticipate there's much coffee to be had as this exciting Synod unfolds. Frank. The hope of the National Eucharistic Revival is to respond to Christ's self-offer by fostering an encounter with Christ in the Eucharist and so transform and renew the church for mission. Encounter, transformation, living a Eucharistic life. The revival is built around five pillars. First and foremost, our task is to foster encounters with the living Christ, especially through the church's teaching, worship, and service at the margins. But this is not just or ought not to be simply a top-down program. The revival speaks of grassroots involvement and being enriched by the Eucharistic traditions of the diverse communities that make up the American Catholic Church. No one is to be left behind. Revival is meant to reach every household, including one. In the Diocese of Davenport, we want to keep the threefold emphasis celebrated and lived always before us. This last point is key. The temptation to reduce the revival to a devotional turn inward needs to be resisted. Pope Benedict insisted that liturgy, whether the mass or Eucharistic adoration must always move us outward. For example, the revival calls for a diocesan Eucharistic procession on this coming feast of the most holy body and blood of Christ. We plan on processing from our cathedral to St. Anthony Church, which will take us through some of the poorer parts of town. St. Anthony, the oldest church in our diocese, runs an important ministry dedicated to feeding those who are experiencing homelessness. So, might we in the procession carry not only the bread of life, but bread itself that the parish will use so that those in need might have life? And might we not invite those served by this ministry to join us for the closing rites and refreshments afterwards? But of course, the revival doesn't exist in isolation. The Synod reminds us that we journey together. In baptism, we are not saved alone. We are made part of the body of Christ. Our theology teaches that the Eucharist both expresses and brings about the unity of the church. It is the heart of synodality. Our spiritual tradition reminds us that the Eucharist is food for our journey together. And as we've seen in pillars three through five of the revival, we are to approach this undertaking in a synodal fashion, listening as well as teaching. Our sacramental tradition reminds us that creation is revelatory of God's presence, and that without creation, there are no sacraments. The Eucharist impels us to hear the cry of the poor and the cry of the earth and respond in love. And Christ's presence is not limited to the Eucharistic species. In the liturgy, we also encounter the real presence of Christ through the word proclaimed and preached and in one another. And the scriptures remind us as well that another privileged locus of encounter with Christ is at the margins. Whether our particular program or event flows from the synod, the revival, or the Laudato Si action platform, the starting point remains the same. We encounter Christ. In that encounter, we are transformed. Transformed, we are sent. How might these overlaps look on the practical level? 
If the Eucharistic, Eucharistic revival is to be synodal, perhaps we might ask, do we celebrate in such a way that fosters the full conscious and active participation of all, respecting the dialogical nature of the liturgy and honoring the gifts and ministries of everyone? Do preachers listen not only to the word, but also to what is happening in the world and to the questions their communities are asking? Regarding Laudato Si, here too, attention to the Ars Celebrandi is important. If what earth has given and human hands have made is central to our worship, do we respect the symbols of the liturgy, using them fully and lavishly rather than sparingly and minimally? Substantial bread in a loaf broken and shared. A baptism that drowns, not just moistens oil poured out and flowing over? Do we use what is natural and authentic rather than what is artificial and contrived, such as living plants, not plastic that ends up in the sea and as Pope Francis just said, kills the earth? Beeswax candles, the gift of mother bees, not fake tubes or petroleum products. Do we build churches that are integrated as well as possible into the local ecosystem, that use natural light to aesthetic and evangelical ends, that minimizes the carbon footprint of the community? Do we give voice to the groaning of creation in our music, in our prayer, in our preaching? If creation is treated with respect and honored in the way we worship, and in the place we worship, perhaps that same respect and honor will mark our relationship with creation the other six days and 23 hours of the week. Kent? As I share a few important dates in our effort to begin work on a diocesan Laudato Si action plan, let me begin in the fall of the year 1224. In St. Francis of Assisi's The Canticle of Brother Son, his poetic song of praise to the Most High, our Lord, he does not say, praise be you for the sun, the moon, and the stars, but rather, praise be you through all you have made. We are to praise God through all of creation. The timeline has been heavily influenced by several key relationships, including connections with Dan Misla and his team at the Catholic Climate Covenant, which have included our staff attending both of the Laudato Si and the U.S. Catholic Church conferences co-hosted by the Climate Covenant and Creighton University. We're also better prepared to undertake development of an action plan because of our relationship with the Iowa chapter of Interfaith Power and Light. We worked with them on a press conference with the launch of the encyclical in 2015, and now undertaking farm, faith, and climate conversations in rural Iowa. We've also benefited by our work relationships within Solidarity, who have served to help two conversations about faith and business over the past several years. And we've also benefited by great relationships with other archdioceses and dioceses in order to learn of their efforts. At the top of that list is the Archdiocese of Atlanta with a trailblazing action plan in the fall of 2015. All of this has been possible because of the full support of our bishops, first retired Bishop Martin Amos and now Bishop Thomas Zincula. They've given approval to, been involved in press conferences hosting or co-hosting Care for Creation events and giving the directive that development of an action plan is to be undertaken. Regarding the overlap between Eucharistic revival and Laudato Si, in Laudato Si, Pope Francis describes the Eucharist as an act of cosmic love, adding even when it is celebrated on the humble altar of a country church. It is an image we will use as we engage with 
and learn from Catholics in rural settings this year. Regarding the overlap between Synod and Laudato Si, I heard Bishop Zinkula describe to Protestant ministers gathered in a rural parish the Synod process, and how in addition to listening to the Catholic faithful and our neighbors, our director of evangelization had posed to him, might we also listen to the cry of the earth? Also from Laudato Si, there is reference to an experience we are to pursue where we become painfully aware of what is happening to the world so that it comes into our own personal suffering, something like what our local moral theologian, Father Robert Grant, refers to as redistributive suffering. This is only possible by listening, truly listening to the other, our neighbors, and the created world. Of the three projects, the development of our Laudato Si action plan is the one that is slightly behind the other two. But attention to listening that is so important to the synod process and a greater appreciation of the Eucharist only stand to benefit what will ultimately develop as a seven-year plan for caring for our common home. Brilliant, thank you so much, gentlemen from uh... The Diocese of Davenport, uh, Bishop Zinkula is truly a, a leader um, in this effort. Um, and so I want to um, pose the question, one of the larger themes that, that are coming through the Q&A box, uh, and uh, I think directed to Sister Natalie, Father David, and Carrie, um, we're hearing uh, from the questioners I guess you would say frustration or confusion with regard to the extent to which their, their pastors and bishops are implementing the synod. Um, so the, I guess the question is, how can we have these pastors and, and bishops lift up the synod in the manner that the Diocese of Davenport has been doing? What advice can you offer to them? Well, maybe I will try to, to, uh, to answer. Uh, in a way, we are all responsible for this synod. It's about uh, a call to be protagonist, to live our baptism as, um, of course, as missionary disciples. And so we have to, you know, there is not one unique way, but the first way is truly to, uh, it's very easy to organize a listening group but the best way is to contact the bishop, the diocese or the pastor at the parish to discuss with him, to listen to him, to express, you know, to initiate a dialogue and to, to try to find ways uh, to, uh, and to offer also uh, support to do the listening uh, sessions and to do the synodal process because nobody alone, a bishop alone or a priest alone cannot do it. So it's truly, you know, to fill uh, part of this uh, and responsible for the synodal process and to, to try to find ways with others, never alone, <laughs> with others. And uh, you can also ask some, uh, if at the diocesan level it's difficult, you have a wonderful national synodal team at the USCCB who can also help. Uh, you can find their contact on the on the website. Yeah, if I might add um, to what Sister Natalie has shared as well, I think that the spirit in which we we try to partner with priests and bishops is so important. Um, I know from my own personal experience, many diocesan priests don't have a significant depth of background uh, in the, the sort of um, the thinking that's gone into Laudato Si and sometimes feel overwhelmed by the pastoral responsibilities they have in their churches already. Um, so it felt in many ways like something that overwhelmed them and that they didn't have time to, to necessarily engage. 
But this becomes an opportunity where a group uh, within the parish can really partner with the pastor, with the associates, and work together to come up with a plan. Um, when that's not the case, as Sister Natalie has been suggesting, I think there's other routes of partnership that we can take. And uh, I think it's important for people not to be shut down uh, or to feel like their voices aren't being heard and simply uh, decide that that's going to be the end of it. This is an important enough issue that we need to keep, uh, in a sense, our spirits up, uh, be patient with what we uh, we encounter in terms of resistance or fear or ignorance, and keep moving, but doing so in really skillful, compassionate ways where we're willing to do uh, some of the heavy lifting ourselves. Thank you, Father David. I don't know, Carrie, if you have uh, an additional response there to that question. Just quickly, they, they have said it beautifully, but in addition, I am a big advocate of lifting up innovative examples where it's working well. So the Diocese of Davenport, just outstanding. I learned so much today. Um, promoting concrete examples of parishes and dioceses that are really doing this well is also important because it becomes a positive uh, influence to others. Wonderful, thank you. And that's a, actually a good launch point for um, a, a second question about how can we, or how can the church provide more services to parishes and dioceses to step into this work? Perhaps you're suggesting, Carrie, that a lot of the innovative practices like the ones in the Diocese of Davenport somehow be communicated or conveyed so that they're getting more practical application of the Synod? Is, is that a fair assessment? Maybe the next iteration of training um, in the synodal process? I am, I am advocating that. I think we can all share examples of vibrancy and effective approaches to this in our in our own local experience. Um, but also, as laity, we cannot give up. Uh, you know, as Father David said, don't don't see an um, an obstacle as a as an impasse, find a way over around under it. It's harder. It's harder work. It shouldn't have to be this hard. But it's what we're called to be. I would also say that uh, first we can be really confident that, uh, as I have tried to say, the Holy Spirit is blowing all over the world and will continue. And we can say that synodality spread by capillarity. And a synodal church is a church in which we all uh, learn from each other. And we are a learning church trying to relearn synodality. So that's wonderful as that it has been uh, highlighted to hear some best practices, good initiative, like uh, from the Diocese of Devonport and others. It will give ideas. And even, you know, what we have been able to do uh, at, with the General Secretariat, for instance, to draft the handbook, the Vademeku help uh, the local churches to do the synod, it was done by listening and gathering many best practices from all over the world, from diocesan synods experience, from uh, uh, the Plenary Council of Australia, other kind of uh, Latin America, who, uh, having also synodal processes. So that's like this. Uh, and it's very important, as it was said, to continue to support each other, to learn together, from one another and to be confident that uh, the Holy Spirit will really help us to discern the ways because there is not one unique way. <laughs> it so depends on the local situations, on the context, on the, on the people, but we will find ways to do this similar process. One image uh, I might share is that from biological sciences, which um, have over the last few years realized that trees have ways of communicating with one another. This is an incredible discovery, in fact, that uh, through the root systems, trees actually move resources from one part of a forest to another. And um, I think it's a really powerful image for us to, to take instruction from um, that um, 
it's very easy when we're isolated or we're working in independent ways um, to feel disempowered in a sense by uh, this greater kind of call to action. But in fact, I think as uh, Sister Natalie and Carrie and others have said, and, and our friends in Davenport have so beautifully given expression, there are tremendous gifts um, ready to be shared. And now, uh, as Natalie used the image of capillary action, the, co the connections are really what's important. The channel, for instance, that the, the, the Climate Coalition has brought together today, that the networks that are possible internationally, the incredible ability we have to connect with one another in ways that we never could have just a short time ago. Um, so don't lose hope, uh, be like the trees. Amen, Father David, thank you for that most apt uh, metaphor um, and actual reality. Um, our time is up. We are absolutely blessed by the Holy Spirit to have all of these wonderful speakers um, with us today. Uh, please note that uh, this webinar will be available to those who registered, um, as well as the PowerPoints. Um, we very much look forward to working with all of you to continue in the spirit of synodality um, and uh, wish you a blessed day. Thank you for your time. God bless. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.